I hope you're getting out there and having adventures wherever you may be. I'm Paul Schmid, the host of The Pursuit Zone, a podcast that interviews explorers from around the globe to bring you their exciting stories. These are people that dream big, break out of their comfort zones, and take on ambitious pursuits. This is episode 173 with Roland Banas, where we talk about his trek through Death Valley National Park. So let's get into the show and let me introduce Roland. Death Valley National Park on the California Nevada border is the hottest, driest, and lowest of all the U.S. national parks. It is also the largest national park in the lower 48, with a diverse environment of sand dunes, salt flats, mountains, and valleys. For three years beginning in 2015, Roland Banas tried and failed four times to cross the park solo and unsupported. In December 2018, he began his fifth attempt. Starting out with an 85-pound pack of food, water, and gear, Roland finally completed the trek in six days, 23 hours, and 55 minutes, covering a distance of 166 miles. Roland has written about his adventure at explorersweb.com. Roland Banas, welcome to the Pursuit Zone. Thank you for having me. So, Roland, I believe in your write-up on Explorer's Web, at the end of it, you said something like a French explorer or French adventurer. How, how did someone from France come to uh, be in California? So, um, that's a long story. But I started my uh, career as an engineer in the oil and gas and the mining industry, and I bounced from one country to the next every couple of years. Then I got two little kids, and I decided that... I didn't want them to be uh, uprooted every two or three years, and I decided to settle down. So my wife and I, we looked for uh, something different to do, something more anchored, you know, in the community. And we uh, finally opened a child care here in uh, Sacramento, in California, a few years ago. Did you say that you have your own business? Yes, I own and run a child care. Oh. With, um, I think we have about 140 kids right now that we look after. Wow. Tough job. Well, it's pretty fun, though. I mean, not easy every day, especially the parents, but the kids are pretty awesome. <laughs> yes. Before you did this type of adventure in the Death Valley National Park, did you have any other types of, or any other of these types of adventures under your belt? No, that was a big first for me. I mean, I always, you know, enjoy outdoors and challenging myself, but I've never done anything like this before. I mean, the whole thing was, it was part of a point too, because I feel like the way adventurers and explorers are portrayed on the internet and the media in general made them, you know, like superheroes. And to me, yes, you know, they're dedicated and, and certainly some of them are extraordinary, but most of them are just like you and me, and they just do things because they want to do them. And I wanted to show that to people around me, especially things like people like my kids and my friends. And say, look, uh, in that case, that explorer, the Belgium explorer, Jean-Philippe Lanc, did this. And it's not too far from my place. And I feel like, you know, it's going to be hard. But that's something that's doable. So I want to try to do it. I was just trying to bridge a gap between, you know, perception of explorers and superhumans and just average people like me. Well, I think that you did it because after I got done reading this article that you wrote, I thought, yes, I think I could do something like this. Um, the way the way that you had laid it out, and uh, I encourage people to go read it, and I'll put a link in the show notes. Yeah, nice job on that write up. I it really did the, it it really encouraged me to try something like this. Yeah, I, I really wanted to, um, you know, incite people to get out. So you mentioned that you had you're fairly fit, and um, you had some perhaps like a background in running. Uh, what's kind of your normal day to day exercise routine or fitness routine? Ooh, I'm so bad with routines, but I enjoy running. So I run two, three times a week, typically, and then occasionally uh, mountain bike a little bit. But I'm not, you know, an extreme athlete by by any means. I just enjoy being out there, basically. Do you run on the roads or do you run on the dirt trails? I like dirt. To me, the road is is a little boring. Yeah, I agree. I, I do dirt as well. Like, how many miles do you usually do in a week? It varies between 
nothing at all when I really don't have time to, it could be 30 miles, 20 miles. It depends. Oh, wow. That's, that's a pretty good distance. So Roland, why did you want to take on this Death Valley trek? Why Death Valley National Park? There's a few factors. One, it's almost in my backyard. So the first time I read about Jean-Philippe, you know, um, completing this, I'm like, this is, you know, a stone throw away from me. And that would make logistics very easy if I wanted to try something like this. The other reason is, um, so I know Death Valley a little bit. And I also know that the valley is laid out in such a way that if things goes bad, there is a number of options to get out, to uh, reach a road or a point where you know someone could come and pick me up. And if things went really south and I'm badly injured, rescue wouldn't be too far away either. Uh, I'd be, you know, reasonably accessible. So, you know, shooting for the first adventure like this, that was pretty comforting to know I had a good way out if things, you know, done sour. I gave some information about Death Valley National Park in the introduction. Is there anything else that we should know about this park and about what you were going through with the landscapes? Personally, I mean, I like deserts, but I think it's a it's a terrific playground. The park has everything from pretty steep and challenging mountains all the way down to sand dunes, as you pointed out, canyons. Is there a lot to do for everyone, starting with little kids to pretty uh, skilled and advanced adventures it's worth going to definitely if people haven't been there yet definitely worth going to probably not in the summer though well. <laughs> yeah well i think it gets a bad reputation because of that and people are scared of it in fact until i researched doing this interview i had no idea it was the largest park in the lower 48 i just assumed it was something like yellowstone would be the largest yeah no it is massive Okay, so before this fifth attempt, you had four earlier attempts. What happened in those that caused you to not be able to complete them? Okay, so my first attempt on the second day, I think, one of my water bag leaked, and I lost half of the water I had with me. So I basically did not have enough to finish. So, well, that one was pretty clear cut. The subsequent attempt... I struggled to find the right gear for me to do this, especially things like shoes. So maybe my feet are more sensitive than the average person. I don't know. But walking with you know, a heavy load on my shoulders on a terrain that's very uneven, very rocky, the sole of my feet were taking a beating and I had blisters and my feet were bleeding and this sort of thing. So after pushing three or four days, it, every time it came to a point where basically I was walking so slowly that I would never finish it. So I had to give that one up. So that was the second and third attempt, the wrong shoes, basically. And the fourth attempt, I really wasn't in the right place in my head. So that was a very different failure for me. The first three times, you know, I hit a wall and I could wrap my hand around it and know how to fix it. The fourth attempt, I struggled the first couple of days going through some, you know, mud and muck and difficult terrain. And basically, uh, I caved. I, I don't think I started that attempt with the right mindset. I wasn't very strong in my head at the point. So I gave up. <laughs> Maybe a day later, but when I was back, it drove me so mad to have given up. But I basically went right back to it. Like a week later, I was back in Death Valley doing it again. And that's the time where I finished it. So only one week went by between the fourth and the fifth attempt? Yes, not even that, maybe. How do you determine which route you're going to take through the park? So the idea was to start from the northernmost point of the park, as it's set on the map, and go all the way to the uh, southernmost point. And that valley is, is you know, a very long valley, so the trajectory is somewhat obvious. The small tweaks, basically, in the valleys is more about finding the um, path of resistance. So following the wash is avoiding the more swampy area, muddy area, and so on. So I, I followed basically um, a very similar route to the one followed by Jean-Philippe Lanc, the first explorer, uh, with some small tweaks. But there really isn't that many alternatives to it, honestly, unless you want to get into terrain that's you know a lot more challenging, and that's already challenging enough, the route I chose. Well, how do you get yourself to the starting point? 
So the starting point is very remote. It, it's lost in the mountains all the way north to the park, and there is really nothing nearby. So you have to drive there or be driven there. I think it's possible to work out some logistics. There are some services in the park that offer tours, you know, jeep tours and stuff, and may be able to um, assist people by driving them and dropping them off. But we're talking about, it's a long way. It's like over 100 miles of driving from the main touristic attractions of a park to that point. I drove my car and parked up there under a tree, basically, hid it out of view. But there was so little traffic, I wasn't very worried anyway. And I recovered my car after I was done trekking at the, the bottom. So in, in all of my attempts, I had someone kind enough and dedicated enough to come and pick me up somewhere in the middle of nowhere and drive me back to my car, which is a long drive. So the logistics not straightforward in that case. Is there cell phone coverage there? So you're just able to send them a text or give them a call? No, most of the park is a dead zone. No cell phones. So I used, you know, one of these uh, e-trex, Garmin e-trex that have the capabilities of sending text through satellite. And that's how I stayed in touch. You've got an 85-pound pack. And, well, let's first talk about the shoes. How did you, what did you learn from your previous mistakes? And how did you get your shoe decision dialed in this time? I've been a hiker for a long time and I've been hiking with backpacks for a long time and I never had that issue before. And I tend to prefer, you know, lighter, faster hiking shoes, even trail running shoes. And I've tried different things, but ultimately I figured, and maybe I should have, you know, figured that faster, but the only way I could carry that load would be with very heavy shoes, basically, you know, pretty stiff, full support, very beefed up. And that's, that's how it worked ultimately. So I had to spend quite a bit of money on my shoes, which wasn't planned for. <laughs> but I did ultimately buy uh, big, solid shoes, hiking shoes. Yeah, probably what I would call the the old school kind of leather, big ankle support hiking boot. Yes, that's what I ended up with. Can you tell us about what you were carrying in your 85-pound pack? Sure. Most of my weight was uh, the water. I mean, I had... 24 liters of water, so that was uh, between 40 and 50 pounds of water, basically, out of 85 pounds. And then on top of that, I had food for about a week, eight days. The rest was basically a basic tent, you know, a basic sleeping system, a few clothes, and that was it. Um, you had a tent, and then did you have like a like a sleeping pad and a sleeping bag? Yeah, that was basically it. Like an, infl- yeah, an inflatable... And what kind of a sleeping bag do you need? Like, how cold does it get at night? So the temperature range, I mean, it varies a lot. When you start in the mountains, especially in winter, the temperatures at night can fall in the 20s. That's not unusual. Definitely in the low 30s. But when you get to that water, you know, the, the southern part of a park that's much warmer, it could be in the 40s at night. I decided to go for something more flexible, so I had actually... A sleeping bag that was rated in the 30s, and I took a liner with me, you know, one of these warm liners that I used in the northern section, and then in the southern section, I basically just used a sleeping bag. In reading your article, you point out that nobody really knows for sure, you know, who the first person was to cross Death Valley. Um, it could have been someone in the 50s or 60s or 70s or whatever that it was never documented. But one of the things that, that maybe differentiates those is that maybe those people were on the roads or whatnot. You um, specifically were staying off trails and roads. What exactly does that mean and why stay off the trails and roads? Um, that was part of a, a challenge I set for myself. It's also how the uh, uh, Jean-Philippe Blanc, that's how he did it because that's sort of his um, philosophy, which I like actually. I mean, I felt like I wanted to do this in sort of a purest form, right? Carry all the load myself without any help whatsoever. And working on a trail or a road is some, is an assistant. It's a help. I I just wanted to do the the simplest, purest way possible. On top of that, there aren't that many trails in Death Valley anyway. So unless you're keen on, you know, following dirt roads, the only way to do, to do this is to be basically off trail most of the time anyway. How are you navigating? I had GPS points that I used as um, a general guideline as to where I was heading. But a lot of the navigation is done basically by sight. You just have to find the best terrain to walk on. 
and that varies tremendously across the park. I mean, some areas, it might be walking inside the wash, even though the wash is definitely not a straight line. Sometimes it's walking, you know, on the side of a dry wash because the terrain is smoother. Sometimes you're going to end up having in front of you this beautiful flat plain just to realize that it's actually very muddy and mucky and it's slowing you down, so you end up doing the detour. A lot of it was visual, basically. The valley is very open and it's pretty clear where you're heading in general. And having a few waypoints was a good indicator as to, you know, the main turns you were trying to reach. But a lot of it is just visual, trying to find the right terrain. On a trek like yours, is it possible to get yourself lost? Not really, no. I mean, you could end up doing a significant detour. If you're not careful about, you know, reading the map and reading the terrain, you can end up wasting a lot of time having to backtrack to find a different route. But lost, not really. Just because you're in this valley, so you have mountains on both sides, and there are a few roads in the park. So even without a map or anything, it would not be that hard to find a way out. Roland, were you using trekking poles? Yes. I mean, with 85 pounds, it's very easy to, uh, you know, trip and lose your balance and be uh, carried away by the pack. So having the poles to uh, stabilize the load a little bit was definitely very helpful. Yeah, I kind of figured that much. I think the trickiest part is at the very beginning of a trek, when you have to go over the mountains and down into the, the canyon, it's pretty steep terrain. And that was pretty challenging to stay upright with the backpack trying to push you down faster than you wanted to go, you know? Were there any permits that are required to do this? There is a voluntary permit system in Death Valley, which means you don't have to fill up a permit, but you're encouraged to just so that if you go missing, uh, the rangers have a better idea where you might be. In my case, because of the length of my trek, there was basically no point saying I'm going to go from the top to the bottom of the park, because that means they have to look for me in the entire park. What I did is I had a tracker with me, and I had friends looking out for me every couple of days to make sure I was still moving, just in case something happened to me. And then I could send an SOS signal in case I had a problem. So my friends were following me, and they would have called the rangers if I had a problem. That was the plan. It looks like in the wintertime when you went, the temperatures are fairly mild, So maybe temperature isn't so much a danger, but what else is a potential danger out there for you? In terms of weather, Death Valley is known for flash floods, especially in the the northern part. So if you're hiking down the mountains in one of these canyons and one of these wash, and you decide to set your tent in the middle of the night and so happen a storm, uh, you could be uh, washed away pretty easily. So that's, that's one of the big dangers in winter. Aside from that, there is... In winter, very little danger from wildlife. There are mountain lions, you know, coyotes, but you don't really see much of them. And things like snakes and scorpions and all of that sort of thing in winters are pretty lethargic. And unless you start digging their burrows, it shouldn't be a problem. I think the biggest dangers I had were, even in winter, things like heat stroke, if you don't hydrate properly, or... um, Simply just, you know, tripping and breaking something or hitting my head and being unconscious and so on and so forth with no one aware that was happening to me. It's just the isolation, really. You're at the start and you're heading downhill on the on the first day. Tell us a little bit about the first day. I think you went 15 miles. What do you see out there and what's the landscape like? So the first day I intentionally started pretty late because I wanted it to be a shorter day, knowing that I had to go through the, the mountain range and that you know my pack would be heavy and I wouldn't be you know quite in shape yet. So the first day you start in this last chance mountain range all the way at the northern end of the park. And it's a beautiful place. It's very remote uh, with a lot of small, almost dwarf trees, Joshua trees. And you have to go up this pass and then down this very steep canyon that's been shaped by flash storms. And you basically walk your way out of this canyon for about seven miles. And then as you get out of this, you get into this big plain. Everything opens up and you're in the core of the valley. You mentioned that on either side of you are mountains. How far apart are they? That's a very good question. How wide is the valley? Is it like a oh. mile or more than a mile? 
No, the valley is wider than that for sure. It's not closed. When you're in it, it just seems like you're in this vast um, open space with these mountains off in the distance. Is that a true statement? Yes, the mountains are really, well, it's, it's sort of a, it depends where you look. So if you look to your left or to your right, you have mountains and they are some miles away in distance. I don't know, five, 10 miles away in, in either side. But you have this view on the length of a valley that goes for tens of miles, basically. By day three, I have in my notes here, in your write-up, you called it the beginning of a crescendo in pain and difficulties. Tell me about by day three, um, what's starting to get more difficult? When you get down from the mountains into the, the main wash of Death Valley, uh, because you're close to the mountains, the, uh, the flash flood have a lot of force and they clean the bed of the wash very well. So they carry away all the rocks. So you walk on on a pretty smooth surface and, you know, progress is easy. But the further away you go from from the northern mountains, uh, the wider the wash gets and obviously the, the water is losing force and you have more and more rocks. And ultimately you get into this jumble of rocks. That's everything that's been carried out from the mountains and it's been laid down in the plain. And you have to walk through this and there is no real good path for it. And we're talking rocks that goes from anything from a pebble to things the size of your head or more. And you have to stumble upon these for a long, long time. And once you're done through this and you think you're going to get a break, you end up into these uh, dry salt marshes, which create this sort of crusty top salty layer that does not carry your weight. So every step you have, your foot sinks into your ankle depth, basically. Every step you make, you basically sink in just like, you know, if, if you're in slushy snow or something. So that makes progress very, very tedious. Once you're pretty tired, you get to the sand dunes with, in my case, a big backpack. So you have to go up and over. I don't remember how many sand dunes, but way too many in soft sand under the heat. And then you get on the other side and you think it's over. Unfortunately, you get into a new patch of... Uh, sharp rocks and slopes that are angled and more marsh sands and and a whole bunch of different things and it takes i think by day four maybe or at the end of day four it starts to get better but there's a big chunk in the middle where it goes from walking into you know from walking on this smooth clean wash surface to a whole bunch of different terrains every one of which is a different challenge from the one before but none of them is nice <laughs> Roland, did you have a strategy in terms of the time you woke up in the morning and was it your aim to try to get started as early as you could during the day? Yes, absolutely. Because I was doing this in winter, uh, the daylight hours are pretty limited. I mean, the sun comes up around 7 and sets down about 5.30. So that's only a little over 10 hours. So I was getting up at first light sometime a little before and basically packing up my tent it was pretty cold when I woke up, so I did not even feel like having breakfast or anything. I was just pack my camp and start walking. And when the sun comes up and it starts warming up a little bit, then I would stop for you know a small breakfast and drop a few layers and then keep going. But my goal was simply to use all the hours of daylight to walk as much as I could. And when it's starting, you know, light setting, the sunset setting, then I would um, find a place to camp and rest. What were you eating? So I did not want to carry any extra weight. So I crossed out the stove and gas and basically forgo any warm meal for a week. So my meals were essentially cereal bars and nuts. Okay. Well, not very exciting. <laughs> what did you have when you got back to Sacramento? About, I think, uh, a day or two before I got to the very end, I sent a text to uh, to my girlfriend and I asked her to bring me uh a can of V8 and some jerky because I was craving salt and vegetables. <laughs> On day five, I have it in my notes here that it says close to Cotton Ball Marsh. And by the way, you use all these these place names in your write-ups and I don't understand what they mean. Maybe they're on a map, but I'm just making a reference here. Uh, close to Cotton Ball Marsh, you mentioned, and the ground became covered in sharp crystalline 
formations that were some of them were at least a f- 12 inches high. Can you kind of describe that area that you were walking through there? There's several of them in the valley, and some of them are called names like uh, the Devil Golf Course or the Devil Playground. These are salty formations, so they're pretty high. There isn't an easy way to walk on them or to step off of them. And they're so sharp that they basically uh, shred shoes literally. I mean, I had solid leather shoes, and by the end of the trek, they were severely damaged. This is uh, rough stuff. It's beautiful, but it's incredibly hard. For how long did you have to go through that type of an area? Hours. I can't remember the distance, but it took a while. By the end, by it looks like by day six, things are easing up and you're able to move faster. Can you describe the last couple of days? Once you passed the middle of the park and this area with the, uh, the marshes and the, the crystals, you get into the soul flats. And some of these are, it's like a parking lot that goes for 30 or 40 miles. It's incredibly flat. And unless you get into some of the areas that are a little more muddy and mucky and a little harder to walk on, it can be really, really fast going. It's a lot easier because you don't have to think about where you put your feet all the time and so on. On top of that, by then, my bag was starting to get a lot lighter because I had you know, used a lot of the water I was carrying and some of the food. So all of this combined you know, was easier on my back, easier on my feet, and the daily progress was much faster. That drove me almost to the end of the park, pretty much. Did you at any time decide to lighten your pack at all? Did I mean, get rid of things? I didn't really have anything to get rid of, honestly. I wish I could have. The only thing I did is when I was closer to the end, I reassessed how much water I needed, and I dumped some of it. So originally I planned for eight days that I could extend you know, to nine if I had to, because I really wanted to finish this, even if I was slow. And I was also basing that on the time it took the uh, Belgium Explorer to do it. So as I was getting closer to the end and not using the water as fast as I thought I would, I dumped some to get my pack lighter. But that's the only thing I could dump, honestly. How much water did you need to have out there per day? I used between two and a half and three liters a day, but it greatly depends. So out of multiple trials I did, one of them I had to give up partly because the temperature were much higher than I expected. And I was using at least three and a half liters per day not to get dehydrated. And the math were just not adding up, especially when you know that the northern part of the park is cooler. So if I was drinking three or three and a half liters in the northern part of the park, by the time I get to the southern part of the park, it would have been more like four liters a day. The time I succeeded, I had planned for more water than I needed. And I got lucky in the sense that the temperature was pretty cold. So I was not drinking a lot of water at all. Some days I was not even drinking two and a half liters. You said in one of the earlier attempts, you must have had water in some sort of a bladder and it broke. Were you still on this, on your successful attempt, were you using water in um, the bladder type things? Yes. So it didn't broke, but the, um, the design of a cap for his water bladders, which are actually really good water bladders, but it's just that the design was such that if you weren't careful when putting the bladders in the bag, there was a chance that the cap becomes slightly undone and then it starts dripping and leaking. And that's what happened to me. I put the bag back in my backpack and by the time I woke up in the morning, the bag was empty. So I changed the cap for something different. I actually uh, ended up modifying the cap that came with the bladder and glued a section of it to make sure it didn't happen and so on. Yes. That engineering background, Roland. (laughs) Yeah. Well, that was more super glue, but it worked. <laughs> How windy was it out there? Uh, someday it's no wind at all, and you wish you had some. Others, especially like the first day of my final attempt, the wind was blowing hard, and I even had some snow, and it was miserable. When I slept at night, I was worried that my tent would fly away on me. So it's, it's completely random. That's what's one of the things in Death Valley. It's really hard to predict what you know the weather is going to be a week from now. There were small moments that you began to appreciate. Can you tell us about some of those moments? I'm often joking with my girlfriend about my bobo cereal bars for breakfast. You know, my daily rhythm was pretty tedious most of the time. It was just about, you know, getting moving and getting fur and so on and so forth. 
after a while, it almost becomes, I wouldn't say meditative, but it, in some sense it is. And you become more aware of small things. Like I was looking forward every morning to the sun rising because that was when the heat was coming on a little bit and I stopped being cold. That was also the time for my breakfast thing. You pay more attention to, you know, wildlife encounters or noticing a flower, especially in Death Valley, these sort of small things. You become a lot more aware of where you are, basically. If you were going to go back and make another attempt, what would you do differently? Now that I've done it once, I wouldn't be you know, too worried about not being able to finish it. So I would go uh, with a lot less water. I would go basically with just what I need and not give myself any cushion. So it's either you know get to the end or have to bail out. There's no, there would be no middle point. But that would save me a lot of weight. I probably would not even use a tent. Actually, I might take a tarp just to uh, get some protection in case of rain. But I would just sleep under the stars and save some weight there too. I think I'd, I'd trim it even more than what I had and try to bring down my backpack weight to the low 70s or maybe even high 60 pounds and be faster. What is your advice for somebody that wants to try this? I think they should, absolutely. It's not easy, but it's within the grasp of someone that's you know really reasonably fit and very motivated. But I would say just to be smart about it, make sure you know you have gears you can trust and that you have a GPS tracker with you and people looking out for you in case something happened because it's very isolated. But I encourage people to do this. I think a lot more people could do this. Did you see anybody else out there during your adventure? So there's um, a handful of time where you have to cross some roads that are in the park, and you do see these cars zooming by. So it doesn't really qualify as seeing people, but it is an odd sight after you know walking alone for several days. I've seen one person on my last trek that had wandered off the road to take some pictures, but wasn't too interested in chatting anyway, apparently. So he ignored me. <laughs> uh, that's about it. I, I didn't really interact with anyone at any time on these hikes. And sometimes that's okay. Yeah, I was looking forward to that, so I, I didn't mind. What did you find to be the most challenging part of this? Uh, to keep going. It is sometimes really demoralizing when, you know, you feel like you've been walking hard and you look at the GPS and you barely made any progress or you're struggling through particularly difficult terrain and you look up and as far as you can see, it's the same thing. But that is, you know, the time where you're like, what am I doing here? Is it really worth it? Definitely a lot to do with the length of Death Valley and it is changing. It. It's, you know, you see quite a few different terrain, but the changes are very gradual and over very long distances. Sometimes it's pretty hard to keep moving. What was one of your favorite moments out there? So as you walk from the north and you get closer to sort of a road that cuts the park in two, there is um, a small town there called Stovepipe Wells. And the first three times that I had to give up, at one point you have to basically leave the main path you set for yourself and head to that town instead. So on my fifth attempt, when I got to that point where it's basically the decision point between going all the way south or bailing out, when I finally was in shape and strong and certain that I would finish this, and I took the, uh, the direction of heading south instead of heading to the bailout point, that, was, um, that felt pretty good. That was pretty emotional. Roland, what's next for you? Any other adventures on the horizon? Yes, I definitely have some ideas. I thought originally that after, especially after failing a bunch of times, I thought that after completing Death Valley, I'd be happy and satisfied and have my, you know, mini life adventure thing. But unfortunately for me, I think it sort of um, opened up a Pandora box and now I want to do more. So <laughs> I'm looking at a few different things. I'd love to um, ski or trek the land for Lake Baikal. Uh, in winter, that'd be one. I would love to go to Greenland as well. Uh, there's a few other things I have in mind. It sounds like it's all cold weather stuff. Well, I've done hot, sort of. I'd like cold now. See a different side of uh, 
the challenge. Sure. Is there any way that people can contact you if they want to learn uh, more about or get more information about your Death Valley uh, trek? Yeah, I think the easiest is just to put a comment on Web Explorer, like on the trip uh, report page, and I'll get an email with their contact info and I can I can get back to them. So that's at the explorersweb.com where you have your article and then if they just leave a comment on the article, it'll you'll be notified? Yeah, yeah I'll get an email with, um, with their questions and stuff and I can get back to them. Perfect. Okay, Roland Banas, thank you so much for coming on the show and uh, sharing your story. Yeah, I really appreciate it. And thanks for doing the write-up so I was able to find you. And we can, like I mentioned earlier, I just think it's a great write-up. And you, you've made it seem uh, attainable for the everyday adventurer, kind of like, like myself. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you for listening. You can find this episode online at thepursuitzone.com slash tpz173. Be sure to subscribe. You can do so by heading over to thepursuitzone.com for the subscription links. And be sure to follow along and like on Facebook or Twitter at The Pursuit Zone. If you want to send me some feedback, you can write me at paul at thepursuitzone.com or you can leave a voice message at speakpipe.com slash thepursuitzone. This episode was recorded on June 3rd, 2019. For the show notes and more great adventure travel podcasts, visit thepursuitzone.com.